in this lecture we will uh, talk about two different uh, uh, concepts uh, one is the other part of uh, open circuit time constant technique that we studied in the last class to find out the upper cut off frequency of an amplifier and that was derived from the transfer function of the equivalent circuit of the amplifier for high frequency region. Today we are going to uh, see a technique called uh, short circuit uh, time constant technique. And this technique allows us to find out omega L, omega L the lower cutoff frequency of the same amplifier for which we have uh, already found out omega H. And uh, for this case, uh, uh, there will be various uh, level of uh, accuracy of the omega L obtained from this technique depending upon the nature of the uh, poles and zero, the, rather the location of poles and zero. Like uh, for previous case, omega H also, we saw that if we have uh, only uh, one pole, then the result is 100% uh, accurate. And uh, when the transfer function uh, approximates closer and closer towards the dominant pole case, then the result is also more and more accurate. Similarly, here also we will see that the result will be 100% accurate in a very simple case. And uh, if the actual system is closer and closer to that uh, simple case, then the omega L obtained will also be uh, quite accurate. So these two uh, things, they allow us to quickly find out uh, omega L and omega H. Not only that, as I was pointed out in the last class, uh, it also points out uh, which component in the circuit is playing major role in degrading omega H or here omega L. The second uh, concept that we talk about is called Miller theorem. This theorem is uh, used to uh, split what is called floating impedance or specifically floating capacitor into grounded capacitor and that then uh, allows uh, to find out uh, poles more quickly. So first we will uh, see this short circuit time constant technique. and uh, see that how this can be used to find out omega L of a circuit. And the circuit that we will take up as an example is going to be common source uh, amplifier. So um, let us consider uh, an amplifier whose uh, say uh, transfer function or rather the uh, low frequency voltage gain is given by this. <clears throat> So that means we have uh, one zero at origin and we have one pole at uh, one by B. So this is a very uh, simple amplifier. And in this case, we want to know what will be the uh, low cutoff frequency, 3 dB uh, lower cutoff frequency. So now if you see the Bode plot for this case, so this is going to be, first we will have a response of the zero and then uh, after certain frequency, which is going to be one by B, the pole will come into picture and the response will become flat. So we see that uh, this is the approximate frequency response of the amplifier. And uh, this value, value in this region is given by as going to infinity KVL. And this we can see will be A divided by one by S plus B is equal to A by B. A by B. 
and this is uh, designated as AV naught and is actually called mid band gain or uh, as here we have done gain at infinity but why we call mid band because when you combine this plot with the high frequency plot to get the complete plot the gain of the amplifier in the mid frequency band is going to be this one right so this is uh, our omega e the pole location now for this simple case we want to know what will be omega l so to find omega l as per the definition what we will have to do is we have to equate this thing to a v naught divided by square root 2 so this is the definition for finding out omega l so in this case uh, when you write the expression in more detail this is what uh, we will have to do substitute uh, s by j omega l this is the substitution we will have to make so this is going to be uh, uh, 3 dB lower cutoff frequency omega L. Now we have taken this uh, transfer function, this one. So this is equation one. So in one we uh, we substitute here equation one. So that will become a j omega L divided by one plus b j omega l and a v naught we have already found out it is a by 2 so this is square root 2 and this on the left side we will have to take the magnitude so what we get here is omega l divided by square root 1 plus b square omega l square is equal to 1 by square root 2 So this is what we uh, get here, right? So B will be also here. So now we can uh, uh, multiply and get square root two B omega L is equal to square root of one plus B square omega L square. We can take square on both sides so this becomes 2 b square omega l square is equal to 1 plus b square omega l square so this gives b square omega l whole square is equal to 1 so it says that omega l is equal to 1 by b right so what it says is that if we have a one of the simplest possible uh, low frequency response or amplifier with this kind of low frequency response then the pole that we get is actually equal to the lower uh, 3 db cutoff frequency so here what will happen is uh, in reality the frequency response will look like this yeah so so in this case the 3 dB frequency is going to be exactly equal to omega p, which is 1 by b. Now, what short circuit time constant technique says is that uh, this b is going to be exactly equal to the sum of time constants. Here, B is so yes. No, in this case, we have only one pole, so we will use only one capacitor. So here are R T H I E is. Thevenin resistance 
add CI. So this is for the simplest case. Now, when we generalize, when we try to take a more uh, uh, general case of this uh, amplifier, in that case, there will be uh, more number of terms in the denominator and numerator also. In that case, the uh, more favorable scenario uh, will be like this, that we have n number of uh, zeros, and uh, then we have n number of uh, poles also. In this case, so in this case, what will happen is uh, this omega L is approximately equal to ratio of Bn minus 1 divided by Bm. And what short circuit time constant technique says is that this ratio Bn by Bn is, uh, is exactly equal to sum of reciprocals of all the time constants. Where there are m number of m number of capacitors in the circuit. So here we can see that uh, because we have uh, n number of zeros, so in the beginning we will have a, a curve which will be rising at the rate of minus twenty uh, plus uh, twenty n. And then each of these uh, n poles, they will uh, try to bring a, about the degradation or the reduction in the slope, and the curve will finally become flat. So in the beginning, you will have plus 20 n slope, and then each of the poles will bring about the reduction in this slope, and it will become finally zero. So this is going to be the uh, body plot of this general function that we have considered. Right? So here you can see that uh, if uh, all these poles, if uh, the zero and all the poles, they are very small, then in that case, the approximation will be better and better. So if we have all these uh, zeros and poles, and this is the you can say the largest pole. If this pole is far away from the rest of the pole, then this graph will approximate to the first case that we discussed. And in that case, the omega L that we obtain is uh, going to be quite accurate. Right. So now, uh, how do we find out these uh, various time constants? So this uh, time constant is equal to CI into RTHI, where RTHI is uh, thevenin resistance corresponding to this capacitor, when all other capacitors are shorted. So here you can see that uh, in this technique, we short the, all the capacitors, but in uh, OCTC technique, we were keeping all the capacitors open. So this is the difference between these two techniques. And uh, that is why their name is based on these uh, keywords. So what will be the steps involved in finding out uh, Omega L? Will be first is of course, uh, draw the low frequency model of the amplifier. And uh, then in that case, uh, short all V sources, V independent sources, in fact, and if there is any current uh, independent source present in the circuit, then that has to be kept open. So these step two is similar to the usual step taken for finding out RTH. And uh, then what we do uh, for 
any ci find rth by shorting all other capacitors and at the location of uh, ci of course we have to connect uh, at ci connect vx and find ix such that rth i is vx by ix right so this has to be repeated for all the capacitors and we find out time constant once we find out the time constant the approximate uh, omega l will be given by sum of inverse of all the time constant so there's one more difference between uh, this uh, mathematical expression and that for the omega h so for omega h sum occurs actually in the denominator right but here uh, sum occurs uh, for the inverse of each of the time constants so this distinction has to be kept into mind Now we will take up the example of uh, common source amplifier, which we have already, uh, for which we have already found out the low frequency response, and then try to find out uh, uh, omega L. The CS amplifier that we are going to consider for moment is this one. And this is a fit by capacitor, input coupling capacitor. And we have source resistance and then VI. So here we see that we have only one uh, external capacitor. And uh, for this case, so uh, the small signal model will contain only one capacitor. So step one is uh, small signal, low frequency, low frequency, small signal. So that means we will not consider any internal capacitors of MOS. So this is our MOS for lambda is equal to zero. Now we have to connect all the registers. So this is uh, R1 parallel R2. And the external capacitors, they have to be there in the model. So this is the complete uh, low frequency model of the this amplifier that we have uh, taken. Now the first thing that uh, we have to do is uh, after drawing this model is uh, short circuit the all the external voltage sources. That means remove all the external sources. Now, so this is the circuit and in this case we have only one capacitor so there is going to be only one time constant tau so for that we have to find out tau here so in the step two what we do is we remove this capacitor and uh, substitute it by a voltage source vx to find out RTH. Now you can see that this will drive current IX. Right. So this uh, source will exist. There will be a certain gate voltage here. This will come into existence, but it is not going to affect what we are calculating here, RTHI. So here we clearly see that uh, uh, VX is simply IX into RS plus 
R1 parallel R2. So RTHI in this case is Vx by Ix is equal to simply Rs plus R1 parallel R2. Therefore, time constant is uh, equal to Ci into Rs plus R1 parallel R2. Right. Therefore, omega L is approximately actually in this case so uh, we will see that it is exact now why this is exact uh, we can recall the uh, transfer function for this which we have already derived in one of the previous classes so if you recall, this will be minus Gm Rd R1 parallel R2 Ci S divided by 1 plus Rs plus R1 parallel R2 Ci S. So here we can see that this is of form As divided by 1 plus Bs. And we have already seen that if we have this type of transfer function, then the omega L obtained from this short circuit time constant technique is uh, exact. So in this case, uh, you can see that uh, B here is equal to Rs plus R1 parallel R2 into Ci, right? And we found that uh, omega L was equal to 1 by B. So here it is equal to Rs plus R1 parallel R2 into Ci. So fortunately for this simple uh, common source circuit where we have only one uh, coupling capacitor, external capacitor, the omega L, L obtained from this technique is going to be exact and uh, given by this factor. Right. So here we have this type of uh, transfer function. This is uh, omega P. And uh, you can see that omega P in this case uh, is uh, going to be given by uh, 1 by this factor 1 by b so this is going to be 1 by b so in this case so omega p omega l they all coincide and they are exact okay. so we can now make this circuit more realistic that uh, what will happen is that in real life uh, if you use circuit in this way then this output will contain both uh, dc and uh, ac so typically we want our load to experience only the ac part so for that uh, what we will have to do we will have to put uh, one more coupling capacitor here and then connect our load like this so actually we will be using our circuit in real life in this fashion so there will be one output coupling capacitor as well so once we modify this for the actual scenario then of course so omega l is also now going to get modified so we will have to now the draw the load frequency model of this circuit and then try to find out uh, omega l and in this case so uh, it will be actually approximate so when we repeat this process uh, you can see that uh, now we will have co also in the circuit so here we have uh, ci the usual and then co will be present here in series with rl and in parallel with rd so this is going to be now the new circuit 
and uh, since we have uh, two capacitors present in this circuit, so there will be two time constants that we have to find out. And uh, in this case, so one can try to find out the transfer function also. And that can be found out uh, with less effort with the help of uh, the transfer function for the previous case, the simpler case. By noting that uh, here uh, we can see that this uh, C naught and RL, they are actually in parallel with RD. So now you can say that uh, in place of RD, what we have is uh, JD or uh, say RD equivalent. RD equivalent. And this RD equivalent is RD in parallel with series of RL and C0. Okay. So if you find out RD, and uh, substitute this RD in the transfer function here, in this transfer function in place of this RD, then what you will get is going to be the transfer function for this new circuit, right? So if you try to find out the transfer function, uh, the new transfer function or the new gain, So this will turn out to contain uh, two uh, poles and two zeros. So this will be minus GM RP CI where RP is parallel of R1 and R2. So minus GM RP CI RD S into one plus S C naught RL. So we see that this additional factor now appears in the numerator. And this is a zero other than uh, zero not at origin. Then in the denominator, we will have uh, two terms. One plus SCI RS plus RP. This term was present there in the previous uh, simple case also. Now we have a second term. It is S because of the CO. CO into RD plus RL. So here we have, uh, you can see that two zeros. First zero is at origin and the uh, second zero is located at uh, one by C naught RL. And then we have two poles. Omega P1 is the usual pole that we already had, CI into RS plus RP. And then now we have another pole at uh, CO into RD plus RL. So if you see the frequency response, then what we have is in the beginning we have uh, plus 20 because of zero at the origin. So this is plus 20 degree slope. And then we, this becomes plus 40 at omega Z1. And then at omega P1, this will get reduced to plus 20 and then uh, at omega P2, this will become finally flat. Okay. 
Thank you. So this one is no longer uh, obviously uh, similar to the simplest case where we had only one pole. So in this case, the frequency uh, omega L that we will obtain from uh, uh, this short circuit time constant is going to be not exactly equal to the 3 dB frequency. So in this case, the actual response will look like this. Yeah. Right. So when we draw the 3 dB frequency, this will be typically somewhere here. Right. Now let us apply this technique to find out uh, this 3 dB frequency. So first thing is draw the low frequency model. So that we have already done there. And then now uh, short circuit VI and then uh, find out uh, RTHI for I, I and O for the input capacitor and for the output capacitors. So you can so here finding RTHI for CA. So this part uh, in fact we have already found out. So here if you see the circuit in this circuit so what that technique uh, says is that you remove this uh, CO, I mean short circuit it like this and uh, put VX here which will drive IX. So we have to find out this IX for VX. Now you can see that uh, uh, even in presence of uh, CO and RL, the scenario is uh, same. That means uh, RTHI that we will find out uh, with even with uh, uh, output uh, coupling capacitor is going to be exactly same as in absence of uh, output coupling capacitor because this input uh, side situation remains same and uh, output side situation has no effect uh, on the input side. Right. So in this case also the RTHI is going to be simply RS plus RP where RP is uh, R1 parallel R2. So therefore the time constant is CI into RS plus RP. So whatever we had it remains uh, valid here also. Now what we have to do uh, for the CO, what we have to do, we have to now short circuit this CI. So we have short circuited and now at uh, this in we have to put one voltage source so Vx which will drive current Ix and this is what we have to find out now. Ratio of this uh, uh, Ix. this ix to this vx so here you can see that source is uh, already grounded and the input side is completely isolated there is going to be no current here so this vg is also going to be zero vs is anyway zero that means this ig current is going to be zero since ig is zero that means entire ix flows through rd and through RL back to RL. So there is a, this loop here 
and i x flows in this loop that means uh, this r d and r l they are basically in series so that means uh, v t h is simply going to be a series of uh, r d and r l so therefore r t h o is simply going to be r d plus r l and therefore the time constant is so uh, c o into r d plus r l therefore omega l is approximately going to be tau y plus 1 by tau o so this will be equal to 1 by c i r s plus r p plus 1 by c o into r d plus r l right so we see that this quantity is no longer coinciding with any of the poles neither with uh, the second pole nor with this the first pole right so in this case so uh, the omega l that actually we have got here is the approximate uh, version of the previous case so not only that uh, here one can uh, uh, see that out of these two term whichever is the uh, dominant one that will have more impact on omega l right so we would like uh, omega l to be as low as possible right so we would like each of these terms to be as large as possible so that omega l is uh, as small as possible so out of uh, these two terms whichever is smaller that will have the most degrading effect on omega l so this also helps the designer to uh, find out who's the main culprit in degrading uh, omega l and then take the corrective measure actually in this case uh, scenario is not very difficult because uh, this ci and co are connected by s so we can always uh, take them larger uh, sorry we can take them larger and larger so that uh, these factors they are smaller and smaller okay. so now we are going to uh, talk about the second concept that is called uh, miller theorem so miller theorem basically uh, splits floating impedance we will take example of a uh, capacitor into two grounded impedances so miller theorem says that suppose uh, uh, you have uh, one impedance z connected between two nodes v1 and v2 and these two nodes they are part of uh, some network right and uh, so here we have to ensure one condition such that uh, v1 and v2 are of opposite sign okay. so this the miller theorem says that this circuit can be equivalently represented using uh, two impedances such that uh, one of the nodes of both the impedance is grounded so z has been split into z1 and z2 floating means uh, 
floating impedance means uh, none of the nodes is at uh, ground level. So here, uh, let us say that uh, we have this current direction. So e this equivalency means that uh, uh, in the second circuit on the right hand side, this voltages V1, V2, they are same as the ones in the left hand side circuit and the current magnitude and the direction that also remains same, right? So this equivalence in, is in terms of these voltages and current in both the circuits. They remain uh, of similar nature, same, exactly same magnitude also. Now let us try to see that uh, if we do this, then what will be Z1 and Z2? And then we will uh, apply this to a capacitor scenario and then try to see that uh, what we get and it's a physical interpretation also. So here uh, we see that on right hand side what we have is uh, V1 minus V2 is equal to Z into I. So this is what we have on the right hand side uh, for the given circuit. And uh, from here we see that uh, current I is equal to V1 minus V2 by Z. Now the same current flows uh, in this circuit also in this direction, same direction. So here also we can write I as uh, V1 minus 0 by Z1. Now current in both the uh, circuits, they are same. So we can equate these two uh, quantities. So V1 minus V2 by Z is equal to V1 by Z1. So it says that uh, Z1 is equal to Z divided by V1 minus V2 into V1. So this can be written as Z1 is equal to Z divided by 1 minus V2 by V1. So Z1 can be written as Z divided by 1 minus EV. So we can call this ratio of two voltages as the voltage gain across this Z1 or between node 1 and node 2. Right. So this is how Z1 will be given. Now for Z2, we have to equate current at the node 2, these two currents. Right. So for Z2, what we get, equation that we get on the left hand side remains same as that of the previous case. But on right hand side, we now have 0 minus V2 divided by Z2. So this uh, Z2 can be written as Z into minus V2 divided by V1 minus V2. And this becomes Z divided by um, V1 by V2 plus 1, which can be written as 1 minus 1 by V2 by V1. So we want to use the same uh, AB to write uh, expression for this case also. So this becomes Z divided by 1 minus 1 by AB. Right. So now where uh, this theorem becomes useful, so this becomes useful for uh, amplifier where we have uh, a capacitor connected across an inverting amplifier. For example, common source amplifier. So now let us take the example of uh, an inverting amplifier.
So capacitor is going to play the role of uh, J. Cross and inverting amplifier. So this inverting amplifier we are taking so that uh, V1 and V2 are half opposite sign. So we have an amplifier whose voltage gain is AB. And uh, here we have V1, here we have V2, and they are of uh, opposite sign. And there's a capacitor connected across uh, this. So let me remind that this jet that we have been uh, taking here in the circuit uh, is one of the uh, impedances in a very big circuit. So there could be a few other uh, components uh, present in the circuit also. So this is the condition. Now let us try to find out uh, what will be the equivalent capacitors for this scenario. So the Miller theorem says that this will now get splitted into two capacitors, one on uh, V1 side, which is input side, and uh, another on output side, that is V2 side. So we will be calling this as, say, CO, and this C as CI. So now let us see that what will be CI and CO. So, so the formula that we have derived uh, is the Z1 is equal to Z divided by 1 minus AB. So here what we have is 1 by J omega C1 is equal to 1 by J omega C into 1 by 1 minus AB. So it says that uh, C1 is going to be equal to C into 1 minus AB. Right. Now AB is uh, negative. AB is uh, negative. So minus AB is going to be positive. So this whole thing is positive. And uh, since it is an amplifier, so this is also going to be large. Right. So this implies that C1 is going to be significantly if AB is uh, quite large compared with C. So that means if you have a capacitor connected across input and output of an inverting amplifier, then uh, the on the input side, you will see a large capacitor. Now, what will be scenario on the output side? So we have seen Z2 is Z divided by 1 minus 1 by AB. Right? So here we have 1 J omega C2 is equal to 1 by J omega C2 divided by 1 minus 1 by AB. So it says, sorry, this one is C. C2, or actually this is CO. We are calling the input side capacitor as CI and output side capacitor as CO. As C uh, divided by 1 minus 1 by AB. No. 1 minus 1 by AB. So here AB is negative and large, so this is going to be approximately equal to 1. So we see that CO is approximately equal to C. It will be in fact uh, larger than C, but uh, slightly larger than that. So having this kind of capacitor across a uh, inverting amplifier is uh, quite uh, degrading because uh, its effect on the input side gets uh, drastically amplified. So here you can see that uh, this scenario will occur in uh, real life because we know that uh, common source has this condition that is uh, input and output, they are of opposite sign. And there is going to be CGD. So what will happen here is this CGD will now appear on the input side as CI 
and there will be another capacitor on output side CO. This CI is going to be CGD into 1 minus EV. And if we take the simplest amplifier case like this, here, the simplest CS case where AV is going to be minus GMRD, then we see that CI is going to be G, G, D into 1 plus GMRD. Right. So, here you can see the scenario is going to be very bad if uh, instead of this RD you have a current source biasing and then you consider uh, lambda not equal to 0, that means R0. In that case, CI is going to be CGD into 1 plus GM R0. So, this is going to be quite large. Right. But on the output side, uh, we have seen that uh, that is not going to be very bad. This is going to be like this. So this will be approximately CGD. So that is why having uh, uh, this kind of capacitor across these two inverting is uh, not very welcome. Now, uh, we would also now like to see more closely that uh, why this kind of capacitor or uh, this kind of capacitor here uh, appears as a very large capacitor on the input side but not on the output side. So we want to see that how this amplification of the capacitor actually takes place. So, we know that uh, C capacitance is uh, defined by charge drawn from source divided by voltage applied. So how much voltage we are applying and how much uh, charge is being drawn from that uh, applied voltage, which is the source. Uh, ratio of these two is going to uh, be called as the capacitance of uh, that system. That is the definition. So now we have here two scenario. We have an amplifier and the capacitor is connected across it in this way. And uh, what we are doing is we are applying this voltage V1 here, right? So for us, the capacitance of this will be uh, decided by looking or putting this whole thing into black box and seeing that how much charge uh, has been drawn by uh, this system from the supply V1 and uh, voltage that we are applying is anyway V1. So this is one scenario. Uh, when capacitor is connected across amplifier. Second scenario is uh, this capacitor is straightway connected to V1 and the other end is ground. Right. So we again have this capacitor connected to V1. So if we put this uh, circle as a black box, then you can see that the both scenario uh, are same looking from the V1. Looking from V1, we have same conditions there. Both uh, charge is being supplied in both the cases. So here also C equivalent is going to be charge that uh, it draws divided by V1. Here also C uh, is going to be charge that it draws divided by V1 that is connected here. Right. Now, in the both the cases, let us try to calculate this Q because uh, V1 is anyway known to us. So, we just need to find out uh, what is this uh, Q in both the cases, right? So, in the left hand side, uh, Q we know that is simply going to be C into voltage across C. So this charge drawn by this capacitor is simply going to be 
uh, this capacitance multiplied by uh, the voltage across this capacitance. Right, so here you can say V2 is zero and here there will be certain V2. So in this case, uh, Q is going to be simply C into V1 minus zero is equal to C into V1. So actually it is not surprising that uh, in this case C remains same. That the actual C that we have connected, the same C will be visible to V1 also. But now in the left hand side, let us uh, try to see how much C will be visible to this V1. So in this case, what happens here is, so here also we have to basically find out this uh, voltage across C. So QE is going to be C multiplied by V across C. But now V across C is going to be V1 minus V2. Right, because V2 is now connected to amplifier. So we know that uh, C is going to be V1 minus uh, V1 into AV from the definition of AV, the voltage gain. So this becomes C into V1 into 1 minus AV. Right, so now the capacitance is the charge drawn, which is QE divided by voltage applied, which is V1. And this you can see will turn out to be one minus AV. So what basically here is happening is the amplifier is making large voltage across the capacitor. Because if you apply a voltage, positive voltage V1 here, what amplifier does is it creates a large negative voltage. Uh, it creates a voltage V2, which is equal to AV into V1. So this is zero and this is a negative minus AV V1. So on the whole, this capacitor now experiences more voltage, although I am applying only V1. So from my side, voltage applied is only V1, but amplifier uh, by pulling down the other node voltage ensures that capacitor experiences a large voltage which is uh, V1 into 1 minus AV. So V1 into 1 plus Gm R0. And since it experiences large voltage, so of course it is going to draw large uh, charge. That means now it will be able to store more charge compared with same capacitor when it is put in this uh, scenario. So capacitance is nothing but ability to store charge since the charge storage capability has increased with because of this amplifier so its capacitance has also increased right so that is the main reason that why on the input side the c appears as a very large capacitance while on the output side if you do the the uh, uh, amplification does not take place from output to input side it is taking always from the input to output side so if you repeat this exercise with uh, a voltage connected at uh, output, say here of the amplifier, uh, then you will see that uh, the voltage that the capacitance that you will get is uh, going to be C into 1 minus 1 by AV. So this is going to be approximately equal to C. C. See, this is CO, this is CI. So this is uh, a phenomena which is uh, used to uh, explain that because of the uh, Miller effect, this effect is called Miller and this multiplication is called Miller multiplication, capacitance multiplied by one plus gain. So this is Miller multiplication. Because of Miller multiplication, on the input side, we see large capacitance. And uh, this is adverse effect on the performance of the amplifiers. 